Well, hello again, everybody. Welcome back to Walking Through the Scriptures with Joseph Pahoda. I'm your host, Joseph Pahoda, and I just want to say welcome to our program. Um, if you haven't had a chance to catch my latest video series, Want to Be a Godly Man, Here are Some Keys, please feel free to go back and check that out. I give 25 keys to how to be a godly man and basically, you know, how to grow in the Lord. So please feel free to go back and check that. And I hope you all had a great weekend. Uh, it's Monday here where I'm at, and I hope you had a great Monday where you were. Um, today I want to do a little something a little different. I'm going to give you my testimony of how I got into the prosperity gospel and basically how God delivered me and got me out. Uh, if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I've said many, many times how the Lord, you know, got me out of the prosperity gospel movement, word of faith movement, the name it and claim it, you know, health and wealth gospel, whatever you want to call it. Um, I was, I got in it about 2000, officially 2003. Uh, and God got me out in 2011. So I've been out of it now for about 12 years. Um, but I never really shared my testimony or my story as to how I got in it and then how God got me out of it. So I want to share that with you today. Um, well, I guess it first of all started with me in the late 90s. Um, I was at a church in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I knew that I felt there was a special push or a call. I, I don't know if it was to preach, but I knew that God was leading me to do something. And sure enough, to make a long story short, um, after fellowshipping with this church in Virginia Beach, Virginia Beach, there was a minister there. He said, you know what, son, you know, or sir, you're going to preach the gospel. So I had people in the church, uh, even since the late nineties, uh, around 99 or so said, I'm going to preach the gospel. Uh, so I knew I was going to be a preacher. I knew I was going to be a minister. I knew I was going to be preaching the gospel uh, ever since the late 90s. Um, so, fat, so now I'm in the military. Um, I'm stationed in Virginia. I'm stationed at Fort Story, Virginia, in, in, which is near Virginia Beach. And um, I leave that place because I'm active duty military. And as you know, if you're in the military, you, you're in a place maybe two to three, four years. And then the Army moves you to a new location. So that's what happened to me. My three years in Virginia were up. And in 2001, I left Virginia and I, I got stationed to uh, Korea. So here I am in 2001 in Korea. And as soon as I get to Korea, um, basically the Lord was like, so son, what did I tell you to do? And I knew right away what the answer was. And I was like, Lord, you told me to preach your word because I knew I was going to preach the gospel. And I said, Lord, you called me to preach your word. And he's like, that's it. That's, that's exactly correct. So start being about that. Unfortunately, though, I had no idea how to do that. Um, what you guys can understand, this is 2001. So this is 22 years ago. So at that time, I didn't have my, my bachelor's degree. I didn't have my um, master's degree. I didn't have my do doctoral degree like I have now. Um, and I wasn't preaching then. So I didn't even know really how to become a minister. I had no idea how does one become a minister? How does one become ordained? How does, how does any of that happen? I, have no, I had no idea. So I started going to uh, some of the, the chapel services there on base, and I started talking to some of the military chaplains. And one of this particular mil military chaplains said, well, you know, well, how old are you and how much education do you have? <laughs> Uh, well, at the time, I was only like 22 years ago, so I was, what, 25? And I didn't have really any education at all. I had my associate degree, but it was in, like, liberal arts. I didn't have any kind of theology or anything like that. So, honestly, that really wasn't much help to me. And so, I was sort of looking around for different churches that would help me. And sure enough, thank God, there was a church off base. Well, actually, it, was, it started on base first. But I finally found them in the afternoon and they had service at four in the afternoon because the military chaplains had their services in the mornings. So they let us use their building in the afternoon. So they had their, they had their service at four in the afternoon. So I went there, make a long story short, fell in love with this church. Uh, the fellowship was amazing. Uh, and I'm still friends with, with some of the people to this day. Um, just, just a wonderful church. Uh, great people, just fell in love with it immediately. And there was one particular gentleman there who was an elder who was there, who was, was also in the military. And he had come from another duty station. So make a long story short, 
he was an elder there and I started, he, he basically became my mentor and slash best friend. I mean, we hit it off in the, in the year and a half I was in Korea. Um, he was just an amazing mentor, an amazing friend. Um, and really, really just taught me a lot. I mean, and in this particular church, there's another thing I'll add. In this particular church, they had a ministers and training program. So I went through the program and I actually gave my initial sermon in this church. They call it a watch night. You know, it's like December 31st going into January 1st into the new year where, you know, you basically have a service to bring in the new year. And, and I preached my initial sermon at this church in Korea. Um, so this mentor um, slash best friend was very influential in my life. I mean, he's the one who basically taught me how to preach. Um, he's the one who helped me mentor me to minister my very first sermon ever in my life. So he was very, very influential and just a really good mentor and friend at the time. And, but then, you know, my year and a half was gone and I left uh, Korea and I, I, and I went to, now it's like 2002, it's at the end of 2002 and I got stationed at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And so I left Korea, eventually the elder left Korea and he got stationed down to, I believe it was Fort Fort Gordon, Georgia, um, which is about a three, three and a half hour drive. It's not very far away. So I was chilling at Fort Bragg for a while. So this is probably the beginning of 2003 now. And all of a sudden he calls me on the phone or emails me or what have you. I can't remember exactly how he reached out, but he's like, Hey Joe, I'm coming to Fort Bragg for about a week for some training. And I want to, you know, fellowship with you. I want, I want to hook up with you again. I said, well, praise God, bring it on. So to make a long story short, we did. We hooked up again. And at the same time when all this was going on, this is when the big father in the faith movement was really big in the body of Christ. You know, if you really want to grow in the Lord, you know, you, you need to father in the faith, right? So I was looking for this father in the faith figure type of person. Uh, to make a long story short, he fellowships with me. He hangs out with me for a couple days. And then he's like, like, Joe, you know, I want to ask you something. He's like, you know, I wonder if you, you consider, you know, basically me being your father in the faith since we've already had this relationship, blah, blah, blah. Well, the, at the time, I thought this was like a godsend because I'm like, wow, this is exactly what I'm praying about. This is exactly what I'm looking for. So I was like, yeah, I thought this was an answer to my prayer. So I was like, yeah, let's do it. So he basically became my father in the faith. Okay. Uh, but immediately though, Something rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, because as soon as he became my father in the faith, he told me, he's like, Joe, I'm no longer your friend. I'm no longer your mentor. I'm your father in the faith. And he started treating me different after that. And make a long story short, over the years, I tithed to him. Uh, you know, I gave him over $2,000 to help him start his podcast ministry. Um, yeah, cause they expect, you know, in the word of faith, prosperity gospel, once you have the father in the faith, particularly if that father in faith is like a bishop or minister or something, you're supposed to tithe to them and all that. Well, since he was the spiritual son of our bishop at the time, uh, he was taught all that. So once he became my father in the faith, you know, he expected this kind of like allegiance and money and tithe and all that, which I did again, over the years, I gave him over $2,000 in tithe and whatnot. So immediately, once he became my father in the faith, it became more of like a, instead of a best friend, he became more of like a, he was a sergeant and I was a private kind of thing. It was like a hierarchy, like he's my boss type of thing. So our relationships changed. Um, but again, I'm young in the faith and I wanted a father in the faith, so I'm like, okay. But then all of a sudden he's like, hey, um, and I got orders to go to, go to Iraq. And so I was like, you know, and now I, now I don't call him by his name. Now I call him dad. Keep in mind, he's in real life, he's only like two years older than me. So I'm like 25. He's like 27, 28. So he's like three years older than me. But now he's like 28 and he, I'm calling him dad. Um, which, by the way, never sat right with me. He always kind of felt like a, an older brother to me, but never my dad. Right. But I'm calling him dad now. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, dad, I got orders to go to order orders to go to Iraq. And he's like, well, son, that's, that's, that's great. You know, because, you know, you may have a chance to preach the gospel or whatever over there. So I was like, yeah, you know, we'll see. Um, but he's like, before you go, what I want to do is I want you to meet 
my spiritual father, i.e. the bishop, I want you to come down to, um, come down to Georgia and I want you to meet him. I'll make a long story short. I go down there and we hit it off. Me and the bishop hit it off like big time. We had great fellowship. It was, it was awesome. And then he, he licensed me as a minister. And he's like, Joe, the reason I'm licensing you with this credentials is because we're affiliated with the, the army chaplaincy. And therefore, if you give the, give this to the army chaplaincy, you know, you'll be able to pre hopefully be able to preach in Iraq with no difficulty. Um, so, you know, you can minister to this in Iraq. Well, I remember that that was like October 13th, 2003. Well, two weeks later, right around Halloween, October 30th, 31st, something like that, I get on a plane to go to Iraq. Make a long story short, um, in February, so about four months later, um, I take over the gospel service in Iraq, and I become the pastor in Iraq, right? And while all this was happening, I was calling back to my father in the faith and said, hey, Dad, you know, they want me to take over the gospel service over here. And I said, you know, I'll be honest with you, Dad, I've been praying about it, and I don't have any, I don't have any cons. I've, I've been doing the pros and cons thing. And I was like, honestly, Dad, I don't have any, I don't have any cons. And he's like, well, son, after, if that's the case and you've been praying about it, you should do it. So I became the pastor of the gospel service in Iraq. And it was a marvelous, marvelous time. It was one of the greatest times of my life. But at the same time, though, they were taking credit for this. Meaning, they would say things like, well, Joe, you know why this is happening? You know why this favor is happening? It's because you're in, connect you're in connection with us. The reason this favor is happening, because, you know, when you connected with me and when you connected with Bishop, you know, like the favor runs downhill. And they, and they quote Psalm 130, 33 and 1 a lot. You know, it's like the anointing that runs down Aaron's beard and runs down his beard and then into his garments and down to his feet. You know, there's, see, Joe, the anointing of God, you know, runs down. It goes from the head and it runs down Aaron's beard all the way down to his feet. So the, the, the anointing or the favor of God runs down, Joe. So it starts with our bishop and then it starts with me and then it now rolls and trickles down to you. So the reason you became pastor, Joe, was because of the favor that's running down on you. See, that's how it starts. That's how it starts. So I, I, I come back from Iraq and now I have orders to go to Hawaii. Now, I don't just, I don't just go to Hawaii. I have orders. I, I re-enlisted in the Army for six more years, and I got a re-enlistment bonus. So not only did I get Hawaii, but the Army then um, gave me like $12,000 to do it. And again, they're like, see, Joe, the reason you got Hawaii and the reason you got $12,000 is because you're in covenant with us. You're in connection with us. And because you're in connection with us, that's why you're getting all these blessings. That's why you're getting all this favor because, you know, again, that favor runs downhill. So you're getting all this, Joe, because you're, you're in covenant and connection with us. Well, you see the idolatry there because they're basically saying your blessing or your favor is tied to us. Now, here's the thing. They, will, they would preach, you know, God is my source. But then indirectly, they were, pre they were preaching and teaching your covenant or your bishop or your father in the faith is your source. So it became really weird how they would, on, you know, behind the pulpit, they would say God is your source. But indirectly, what they were really teaching is, no, your source is your man of God. Your source is your pastor. Your source is your bishop. Your source is your father in the faith. And, and basically what that is, it becomes like a manipulation tool because God forbid if you ever leave your pastor or leave the church, because then you're going to think that your favor or your blessing is going to leave you. So it just manipulates people to stay into this kind of abusive relationship because you're afraid to leave. Because after all, who wants to get rid of their blessing? So they're like, yeah, Joe, the reason you became pastor and the reason and the reason that you got Hawaii and the reason you got a re-enlistment bonus is because you're in covenant with us. Now, be, I'll, I will say this because I forgot to say this point. Before he became my father in the faith and before Bishop became my bishop, he's like, Joe, you need to meet the bishop and you need to meet our church because we are a word of faith church. Now, I'll be honest with you guys. I never heard of word of faith. I never, I had no idea what that was. Now, again, this is back in 2001. So when he said we're a word of faith church, I'm like, okay. And I mean, I didn't think anything of it because again, I've never heard the term before. I had no idea what it was. So, so here we are now. Now it's like 2004, 2005, and I'm in Hawaii. 
And I got the re-enlistment bonus. And they're like, Joe, you know, you got all that basically because of us, you know, because you're in covenant with us. You're in connection with us. And again, just like the anointing runs down Aaron's beard, it ran on you, Joe. And that's what happens. And they would tell me things like, you know, well, you know, Joe, um, you know, Bishop's church has like 1,200 people. And you know, as the anointing runs down, the, the, the anointing or the covenant gets bigger as generations go by. And they use this analogy of like, you know, Joe had like, you know, Abraham had Isaac, but then Isaac had Jacob and Esau. And then from there, you know, Jacob had his, tw you know, his 12 sons. Uh, and then from there, you know, the 12 sons became the, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's like every generation, you know, the, the covenant increased as it went on, Joe. So if Bishop has 1,200 people at his church, you know, I'm going to have like 4,000, Joe. And Joe, your church is going to have like 8,000. They would tell me things like that. Because again, the, the blessing or the covenant runs downhill. And as, you know, the generation upon generation goes on, excuse me, supposedly the generational thing gets bigger. So apparently now I'm supposed to be pastoring some, in the, in the future, some 8,000 member church. I'm going to have a mega church. And they were prepping me to be that next guy. You know, they would have their conferences and they would pass the mic to me and I would preach or whatever. So, so the people got to knew my, to know my face and they would know when I, when I would go to the Bishop's conference, they would like, Oh, that's Bishop's spiritual grandson. You know, because again, my father in the faith was his son and now I'm the son of the son. So now I'm the spiritual grandson of the Bishop. And I got to preach at Bishop's church on a, on a Wednesday night Bible study. So the people got to know my face. And when I would go there, they would give me the red carpet treatment. When I preached at Bishop's Church, they would. I, I had an armor bearer who carried, carried my Bible. He carried my water. He helped me put my blazer on as before I went up to the pulpit. I mean, I had an I had an armor bearer just like the bishop did. The whole thing. I mean, when I went to the bishop, the Bishop's Church, they they rolled out the red carpet for me because I'm Bishop's spiritual grandson. And again, they tell you that this is all part of being in, being in covenant with us. It's almost like you're in the mafia, you're in the mob, and you're like a made man. And so once you're the made man, you're going to get the world treatment because you're a made man. Um, looking back at it now, it's like, this was so weird. Um, but that, that's what they did. So again, and, and when, you're, when you are in your early 20s like I was, and you, know, you were looking for a father in the faith like I was, and you seem to be getting all these blessings, you're like, this has to be God. I mean, I got Hawaii. I got money. They're rolling out the red carpet for me. This has to be a God thing. But then, like I said, then I, then I finally got to Hawaii. And to make a long story short, I knew I wanted to get my degree in theological studies. I had my associate at the time, but I wanted my bachelor's and master's. And I wanted to get it in theological studies. So to make a long story short, when I was in Hawaii, they had... Um, Wayland Baptist University there, a branch campus, and they had Christian ministry, you know, theological classes. And I got, eventually took me some years, but I eventually got my bachelor, my bachelor's and master's through Wayland Baptist University starting there in Hawaii. And as I was in Wayland Baptist, I would take classes like biblical interpretation and hermeneutics and how to preach and how to, you know, how to properly interpret a text in context and how to eisegete a text and all that. Assuming not eisegete, exegete, how to exegete a text and all that. And I realized that what I was being taught about prosperity was just absolutely wrong. I realized a lot of the sermons that I was taught about prosperity or even the whole anointing running down the, the beard of Aaron was absolutely wrong. Um... And I was taught pretty much early on, but since I taught, since I got, since I took my very first biblical interpretation class, I knew how wrong the teaching was. The other thing that happened to me was I realized how wrong their teaching was via experience. Because part of the word of faith movement is you just name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. Right? So you can just, in their theology, you can speak whatever you want into existence. So when I went to Hawaii, I was a staff sergeant at the time, and I wanted to get promoted to sergeant first class. So I basically, I, before the new year hit, I basically wrote out and typed out a vision board of what I wanted the new year to be. 
You know, I thank God that I'm highly blessed and highly favored. I thank God that, you know, in 2000, at this time I think it's like 2005. In 2005, I'm going to make the E7 list. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a sergeant first class. And I thank God I've been blessed with favor with my bosses. And I've, I've been blessed favor with my, my, my unit and everything. And, you know, I'm going to get promoted and I'm going to have favor with my, my, you know, favor with my bosses and blah, 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 blah. You know, they would call that a vision board, but really what it is, it's, it's new age. It's, um, the law of attraction is really what it is where you, you basically dream cast your, your ideal dream. And then you believe that these good things are going to come to you. This you're going to attract what you want. It's basically new age mysticism. It's, it's basically law of attraction on steroids. I mean, that's really what it is. Because obviously God is not obligated to bless our dream. God is obligated, if you will, to bless his dream or his purpose for your life. So you, and you can't manipulate God and to make him do what you want him to do for you. So I wrote this whole entire, you know, the vision for my life for 2005. I'm going to get promoted. I'm going to have favor with everybody. My unit's going to love me, blah, 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 blah. Make a long story short, I go to Iraq this time for the second time because I get, I get deployed out of Hawaii to Iraq again. And and be, again, because I just got done pastoring the first time, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go to Iraq. I'm going to pastor again. You know, I'm going to, you know, this is part of the mega church. You know, this is part of my, it's going to blow up and I'm, I'm going to become the next big thing. Well, make a long story short, saints, that deployment was absolutely terrible. Um, not only did I not get promoted, um, I had zero, almost zero favor with any of my bosses. Um, believe it or not, um, I actually got fired from the position I was in. Um, and I had to go to another section in the army because the, the section I was in, they didn't want me. Um, yeah, I literally got fired. Um, they did not like me at all. I had z almost zero favor. And by the way, uh, I didn't pastor a gospel service over there. <laughs> Um, it was just a very, very hard, hard, hard deployment. Um, honestly, of the four deployments I was on, that second one was absolutely the worst. Absolutely the worst. The one saving grace I had, though, was towards the end of the deployment, I did get, I, had, I put in a warrant officer packet, and I got picked up for a warrant officer. And... So I left that deployment and I went to go back to the States So I had because I had to go to warrant officer school. So even though I got fired and even though that deployment was terrible, I did, praise God, did get selected for warrant officer and I eventually became a warrant and then I eventually retired as a CW2 after 20 years. But even then, they kind of took credit for that. I mean, the covenant, because my father in the faith was also a warrant officer in the army. And he's like, see, see Joe, I'm a warrant, you're a warrant, you know, this... The, the anointing keeps flowing. So they, so they, they, they sort of kind of took credit for that too. Um, but I realized everything I said in that vision board didn't happen. I didn't name it and claim it. I couldn't blab it and grab it. And there, matter of fact, not only did it not happen, but almost everything I typed up, the stuff that happened to me was the exact opposite of that. I didn't have five favor with my chain of command. Like I said, I got fired. It was the hardest deployment I was ever on. I didn't pastor again in Iraq. Um, yeah, I didn't, I, you know, I got selected for warrant as opposed to sergeant first class. I did get promoted, but it wasn't in the promotion that I was thinking I was going to get. Um, turns out it was better though, praise God. Um, so everything I typed up was the exact opposite of what I, what I spoke. Um, very hard deployment. I didn't have favor. Like I said, I got fired. It was very, very tough. Um, so I realized I couldn't name it and claim it. I couldn't blab it and grab it. I couldn't speak it into existence. I realized the hard way that that theology was a lie. Now, as all this was happening, I was still taking classes at Wayland Baptist University. And... I'm like, yeah, I'm realizing it's a lie because they're not properly teaching the word of God right. So now it's like 2008, 2009. And I was like, man, I, I just can't do this anymore. Like what I believe and what I know, <clears throat> this is completely opposite of what they're doing and saying. So 
around 2009, and now here's the thing, now why all this is going on, I had already tithed $2,000 to my father in the faith, and at the same time, I was given $50 a month to Bishop's Church, so I was like given to the bishop and stuff too, but, but I was like, you know what, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that anymore, because I don't really believe in what they believe and what they teach, so I stopped giving, and as soon as I stopped giving to the Bishop's Church, because they, I, I would give $50 a month, and I would get like a CD from them. Um, but once I stopped giving the $50 a month, the CD stopped, the teaching stopped. They completely cut me off. Um, at, by this time, I wrote a book um, called Word of Faith Preachers. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Holiness, can the church do this or not? This was my first book that I wrote in 2009. And the, bishops had, the bishop had a bookstore. And he's like, yeah, Joe, you know, come on down. You know, we'll put your, your, we'll put your book in, you know, our bookstore. We'll promote it, blah, 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 blah. Well... Once I stopped giving, none of that happened anymore. Uh, they never promoted my book. The CDs stopped coming. They basically completely cut me off. Um, and I kept getting more and more education from Wayland Baptist, and eventually I said, I, I can't do this anymore. So around 2011, now I get deployed um, as a warrant officer. I get deployed back to Iraq as a warrant officer now. And I eventually emailed my father in the faith and I said, hey, dad, I, I'm still calling him dad. <laughs> I said, hey, dad, I can't do this anymore. Um, I'm not word of faith. I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher. I can't do it anymore. And that was that. And now to his credit, he's like, well, Joe, I wish you nothing but the best. I still love you. So it was a very good and cordial break. Um, but as I was doing that, <laughs> God was giving me another idea, Word of Faith Preachers, a misinterpretation of Scripture might lead you astray. I wrote this book on my third deployment as a warrant officer in Iraq, exposing all the lies of the, of the prosperity gospel. Now, what I didn't say was, my bishop's father in the faith was Creflo Dollar, and Creflo Dollar's father in the faith was Kenneth Copeland, and his father in the faith was Kenneth Hagin Sr. slash Oral Roberts. So that was my spiritual family tree. It was Kenneth Hagin Sr. slash Oral Roberts, uh, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, my bishop, my father in the faith, then me. So that was my spiritual family tree, if you will. And they were prepping me to be the next guy. Okay? But after I, I, after I emailed my father in the faith, I said, you know, hey, Dad, I can't do this anymore. I officially left in 2011. And at the same time, I wrote this book exposing all of their all their lies, or at least a lot of them. So I wrote this in a, I wrote this in Iraq, and then it was published in 2011, and that's when I officially left the movement. So, and I've been out of the movement ever since. And for the last 12 years of my life, I've dedicated my life to helping people get free, helping them to see and expose the lies. It, to, to hear the false teachings, to hear the manipulation, to hear the controlling, to hear, you know, that manipulation like I was given. Um, I've, I've dedicated my life the last 12 years to help people get free from the bondage that I was in. Um, and it is bondage. But again, if you're looking for value, from, if you're looking for validation, if you're looking for a sense of value, which I did, I was a young 25, 26 year old young man and I was looking for validation. I was looking for a father in the faith. I was looking to be valued. I was looking for all that. And when the prosperity gospel word of faith people come knocking, it's going to seem like it's like it's of God because it's going to, they're going to present themselves in such a way that it's going to seem like it's everything you've been praying for. And then when the blessings start flowing and they, lo they roll out the red carpet for you, you're going to think this is God. Because they're going to paint it in such a way, they're going to say, see Joe, the reason you're getting armor bearers and the reason you're getting all this stuff because this is part of the favor of God. So when the money starts coming in, when the, when the, when the book endorsements come in, when the, this comes in, when that comes in, it's all part of God's favor. And really what it is, is really just a big pyramid scheme where they're just scamming you and taking advantage of people. Now, I believe a lot of, a lot of these guys do and truly do love the Lord. I mean, I've met them. I've talked to them. 
they do love the Lord, but they got a lot of tainted, tainted teaching. They have a lot of false teaching in their stuff. I will say this ever since, um, I left the movement in 2011, me and Bishop have never spoken. So me and Bishop have not spoken in 12 years. And I did speak to my father in the faith, well, now ex-father in the faith, about about a year or so ago. When Remember when Kenneth Copeland did that whole, when he so-called rebuked COVID-19? And obviously he didn't. Now, again, the reason Kenneth Copeland did that is because he believes in name it and claim it. So the, re, the whole reason Kenneth Copeland did that was he believes he can speak it into existence. So he believed he could curse COVID-19 and COVID-19 would have to die because Kenneth Copeland said it. Okay, that's part of his theology. So I, I emailed my former father in the faith and I said, hey, now by this time I'm not calling him dad. I said, hey, you do know he was, that was wrong and that was, a, you know, he's a false teacher. And he, that's a, he's a false prophet because he said, I stand in my office as a prophet and I, I declare right now that I curse COVID-19. I said, he gave a false prophecy. He's a false prophet and he's a false teacher. Well, my, for, my former father in the faith came back and said, come on, come on, come on now, Joe. You know, obviously Kenneth Copeland, you know, he wasn't being led of the Lord. You know, obviously he prayed, but obviously his prayer wasn't of the spirit. And, you know, he basically, he just missed it. But to say he's a father, to say he's a false teacher, I mean, come on, Joe, who hasn't prayed a wrong prayer? Who hasn't prayed something that wasn't of God, it wasn't in the spirit? You know, we just missed it. Who hasn't missed it? You know, who hasn't made a wrong prayer? But to say he's a false teacher, Joe, I mean, that, that's taking it too far. Well, the fact that, yeah, we all made dumb prayers in our lives. But again, that's not what he was doing. He wasn't praying for COVID-19 to go away. He was demanding COVID-19 to go away because that's what Kenneth Copeland's theology is. And obviously his theology didn't work. So my point is, my father in the faith covered for him by changing the narrative. Instead of admitting Kenneth Copeland's a false teacher, Kenneth Copeland was wrong, Kenneth Copeland's theology is trash, and it's a false teaching, instead of admitting that, he just said, yeah, he was praying and he wasn't being the Lord, therefore he missed it. I, he, he changed the narrative. Instead of saying, yeah, the reason Kenneth Copeland did that is because Kenneth Copeland believes you can name it and claim it, and obviously naming it and claim it doesn't work, therefore it's a false teaching. Instead of admitting that, he covered for Kenneth Copeland and he changed the narrative and said, yeah, he prayed, but he wasn't being led to the Lord. Therefore, he, you know, he prayed a wrong prayer. And at that moment, my heart sunk. Because again, this is about a year or so ago. And I knew then that my former father in the faith, he's so still knee deep in this movement that he's blatantly deceived. And again, this is the man who basically taught me how to preach. This is the man that had huge influence on my life over 22 years ago. Taught me how to preach. All of that. And this man is deceived. So I'm praying for him. I've been praying for him ever since. Um, but this man is deceived. So the Lord used Wayland Baptist University and my professors, so I thank God for them. And as hard as that deployment, my second deployment was, the Lord used that second deployment to let me realize um, you can't name it and claim it. Because everything I tried to name and claim, that, that deployment was the exact opposite of all that. Um, so it was a wake-up call. And it, was, and it was a wake-up call now, knowing my former father in the faith is still knee-deep in that deception. The fact that he's defending and changing narratives to defend Kenneth Copeland. That's what, he, that's what they're doing. They're, they, they spin it. They spin it to defend him. And that's what, my, that's what my former father in the faith did. So pray for him. Pray for him. I don't know what my bishop's doing. Again, my bishop had... I can't even say my bishop. He's not my bishop now. But I haven't spoken to bishop in over 12 years. And I have no desire to. Um, I mean, I love him, but I don't really want to. I don't have a need to. Um, he probably says the same about me. Um, but 
pray for him and I pray for my former father in the faith. My father in the faith is deceived, ladies and gentlemen. He's absolutely deceived. Um, he Not only will he not cut ties with the prosperity gospel, but he'll make excuses for it and he'll change the narrative to make excuses for it. So he's deceived. He's absolutely deceived. So pray for him. Pray for my former father in faith. So anyway, again, pray for him. That is my testimony. That is my story. That's how I got in it back in 2001, 2003-ish. And that's how God got me out of it. And that's what I've been doing the last 12 years of my life. All right? So I hope that's a blessing to you because I've shared that in other videos, but I haven't given you the full story. But today I give you the full story. All right? So until next time, if this has been a blessing to you, hit the like button, hit the share button. And please hit the subscribe button. Please tell all the people to subscribe as well. Until next time, know that, you know, God loves you, 92. God bless everybody.